Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your hosts, Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230. Or toll free. Toll free. one 866 055528. That's 1 866 820 KLAV. Now, let's bring on the hosts. Here is Michael McAuliffe and Jen Solis. Good afternoon. This is Michael McAuliffe. I'm Jennifer Solis. And welcome to another edition of the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, where we talk about the emerging billion dollar industry in the state of Nevada and beyond. Uh, we're going to get into some of today's news stories. We have some announcements, and we do have a very special guest this afternoon. Uh, our guest is former Assistant Sheriff Ted Moody, who is now running for the office of Sheriff of Metro. So, um, welcome, Ted. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm I'm really thrilled to have you here. Uh, we very much want to interact with law enforcement uh, on a on a proactive citizen level, uh, where, yeah, where we initiate the contact that. Uh, as much as we can, <laughs> and. Um, uh, we're more than happy to, to, to speak with you on some really important issues for the community. Um, in the meantime, though, uh, as, as we get started, we have, uh, we have some, uh, some news over the past week that we want to get into. But uh, at the top, we're going to start with a meeting tomorrow night. Um, tomorrow night, we have a meeting for the city of Las Vegas. The city of Las Vegas is to hold two meetings on zoning and licensing procedures for medical marijuana. The two meetings um, tomorrow, Wednesday at 3 p.m., March 26th, and 3 p.m. Tuesday, April 1st at the Development Services Center located at 333 North Rancho Drive on the fifth floor. This is a meeting for people that are interested in dispensing, distilling, and testing and growing marijuana. And so it says at last Wednesday's council meeting, the council voted five to two to move forward and allow medical marijuana on the, in, within the city limits. And the council also extended the moratorium from accepting licenses applications until July 2nd. What do you think about that? Well, the, the reason that they're uh, putting that moratorium and extending it is they don't expect that the state is going to be uh, ready to have its own licensing uh, window open until that time. Uh, I do believe from speaking with uh, Councilman Bob Coffin though, that uh, should the state open its window earlier, that uh, the city will likewise then open its window concurrently so that they don't miss out on uh, the potential dispensaries uh, and other MMEs that will come out of that um, that state application. So they're while they're holding people off, they're still hedging their bet on this? Yes. Um, you know, uh, we said um, that previously they, they hadn't bought the house, but they had ordered the blueprints. Well, I, I was a little wrong when I made that statement they hadn't <laughs> bought the house but they bought the property now now last week they've ordered the blueprints they, they've told uh, with the vote that uh, councilman coffin had they told the uh, city uh, staffers to go ahead and immediately start developing the regulations uh, to put them in place uh, for when this window opens up so we will see the city of las vegas moving in this direction and they are likely to be joined, we're hearing, by uh, North Las Vegas and perhaps even Henderson now, uh, who both see the, the economic windfall here and they don't want to lose out on it. We were at this meeting last week and there was clearly at that time uh, a four to three majority in favor of moving forward with this. And then the five to two vote was because Carolyn Goodman changed her vote after the initial vote so that she could support it. Okay. All right. Um, and, you know, some more news that's coming out of Clark County is that Clark County is not going to allow the influx of cannabis into Clark County. So if you grow somewhere else, you can't sell in Clark County to dispensaries. Is that is that what the wash came out? That's what the wash came out, and it can be seen uh, in, the, in the county commission as a purely protectionist measure. And what happened was... Uh, 
Commissioner Sisolak last week was touting the fact that these grow operations can employ 200 people. And he said, well, if we're going to have 10 grow operations, that's 2,000 people. I want those jobs here in Clark County. And you But know. that's not correct. There are only 10 dispensaries allowed within Clark County, and they were saying that likelihood on the on the grow level, it would be like a three to one number. And so that yes, would be well, much greater. So that, that would than, actually, uh, by his figuring, mean uh, 6,000 jobs. But I can't imagine, un- unless you had 40 acres up in Northern California somewhere, I can't imagine requiring 200 employees for a uh, for a, a cultivation facility. It just exactly. boggles I mean, the mind. Well, it does boggle the mind because, you know, in growing, it doesn't take as much pa- manpower as in harvesting. And there's a big difference. You only h- hire some people to harvest um you know, during harvest time, you don't you don't have those people on retainer for the whole entire time because to grow doesn't take that many people. No. to harvest. And, takes and a few people. weeks ago, we spoke with uh, United Food and Cannabis, United Food and Commercial Workers International <laughs> Union Cannabis uh, and Hemp Division Director Dan Rush. And one of the things that Dan is saying is that the union will be providing contract workers to do that trimming work, so that an employer does not have to staff up or or be consistently looking for new people to come in just for a couple of weeks at a time. So uh, I think that Commissioner Sisolak's view of that is is not... It's kind of skewed. It's, 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 he's listening to what somebody told him. He's listening to what somebody told him. They're saying, oh, these are jobs that are going to somewhere else. But if the cannabis, if the... If the union comes in just to help with the harvest, are they going to choose local people to do that, or are they going to contract out? I would think so. Out, it's going to be a local you know? union. It's not going to be out-of-state people. But the, the question here is whether the county can actually prohibit something coming in from another county in a in a commercial uh, environment. And Senator Siegerblom, who authored the bill, says he does not think this will stand a, a court challenge. And there are people who point to a, a raw milk case uh, several years ago wherein a county tried to stop the raw milk from coming across county lines and it was it was uh, denied so we don't really think that this is going to, to stand it's just going to take somebody to come up and, and challenge it in court but meanwhile the county commission did move ahead with this there they not only voted to go ahead with the program and allow for an uh, an open-ended number of cultivation sites depending on need but uh, they also said that if the municipalities do not take their allotment of dispensaries, uh, the 40 that that Clark has allowed, uh, that the county will take all the excess. So Mm -hmm. if Vegas goes and takes 10, but the other municipalities say no, then Clark County is ready to step up and grab the other 30. And I think this is what's driving the other municipalities in the direction of accepting these businesses within their borders, because they know that if they lose out on this opportunity this time around, that Next time, there may only be one or two licenses available, and so they will lose out on that benefit for years to come. Well, exactly, and they also probably realize that if they have patients that are within their municipalities and they are a patient, they will travel outside the municipality to get the medication, so it doesn't matter. It's going to be brought into their area anyway. It doesn't matter if they don't allow the dispensaries because it's going to be in the area with patients. You know, I, I just... I don't see that uh, happening. And the other thing is, is that if Henderson doesn't allow dispensaries, but Clark County does, conceivably, everybody in Henderson can continue to grow. Yes, that's absolutely true. And uh, mm-hmm. oddly enough, the the county commissioners decided to go with the state recommendation on distance separations for dispensaries from residential units, meaning 1,000 feet from sc- public schools and 300 feet from community resources like parks, swimming pools, child uh, daycare facilities, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but for the cultivation side, they, they're maintaining now a 660-foot distance from so residential. So that just bungs up vertical integration. Uh, yes, it does. It, it really uh, uh, drives a stake in the heart of that whole concept of from seed to sale that the, the legislators wanted. But also it's the idea that at first, people were saying, oh, no, dispensaries bring a lot of crime, and we don't want that crime, and uh, we can't have dispensaries because they have crime. Now they're saying, well, the dispensaries are okay in the neighborhood, but we can't let people be b- growing plants anywhere near where people live. Uh, growing plants is really dangerous. You know, and I so, was talking and, and Ted, to... Ted, I see you over there shaking your head. What do you think of this? 
Well, I'm just listening to all these details and, and digesting it all, and I think the, the rationale behind some of it is, um, is uh, uh, lacking evidence, mm-hmm. you know, in some cases. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, that people said uh, as I was speaking about was that they that you have people like Mayor Pro Tem uh, Stavros Anthony and, and others who say, well, uh, you have these medical marijuana dispensaries and they increase crime, and so it, it's a dangerous thing, and you can't have them because they increase crime. Now, I'm looking at a a. a, a a study uh, published in the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs, and investigators at uh, University of California of Los Angeles examined whether the proliferation of medical marijuana dispensaries is associated with elevated crime rates. And what they, did they find? Well, well, they they looked at 95 census tracts in Sacramento, California, during 2009, and they said that there were no observed cross-sectional associations between the density of medical marijuana dispensaries and either violent or property crimes I- rates in this study. And these results suggest that the density of the, the medical marijuana dispensaries may not be associated with crime rates uh, and that other factors that the dispensaries take to reduce crime, doormen, video cameras, 24-hour security, may actually increase the guardianship in that neighborhood and reduce crime. Well, so, not only that, I've heard of dispensary owners that, that they go out into the neighborhoods and they clean up graffiti um, you know, because they don't want it around their business mm-hmm. uh you know have their people clean up garbage you know and, and and do and do stuff like that to improve their neighborhoods i really haven't heard of a lot of dispensary owners that that attracted or drew crime i think the only um you know illegal act i guess is actually selling the cannabis at this point yes um, around them yes. Uh, well not i mean not the legal ones but we have um, uh, here's a report from uh, the Marijuana Majority's director, Tom Angle. He noted that in addition to uh, adding both security guards and increased foot traffic to a given area, dispensaries also reduce crime by allowing pot smokers to, ob- or in this case, medical patients, uh, to <laughs> obtain the plant without having to turn to the black market. And, it, and he says that it's not like marijuana wasn't already being sold in these neighborhoods. It was being sold illegally on the street by gang members, and the cities aren't getting any tax revenue from that well what's what's your opinion on this do you uh, have you looked at this at all do you think that well that it'll increase crime or, or not or i think the jury the jury is still on out on that in my opinion i i really doubt it uh, as you pointed out the grow houses exist today they're illegal they operate in in uh, residential areas uh, even the grow houses don't don't bring an overwhelming amount of violent crime to those neighborhoods we, we usually find out about grow houses when somebody discovers uh, something there's a fire uh, mm-hmm. inside mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's an electrical um, a problem that causes a fire or um, a neighbor sees something and tells the police about it somebody discovers there's an inordinate amount of power being used in a residence on rare occasion and I'd be hard-pressed as I'm sitting here to give you a specific example but I think on rare occasion um, you know uh, somebody operating the black market is trying to rip off somebody else operating yeah. in the black market. Uh-huh. What, what we do know is that the black market does, in fact, result in violence, right? We, we yes, know that. we do. We have data on that. Yes. We don't have data, really, on um, uh, what is going to happen when we begin to eliminate uh, the black market uh, sale of, of uh, marijuana, starting with medical marijuana. And, and that's been the result of 75 years of prohibition, which uh, does not allow for these social experiments. And you, and you see, uh, I think that's one of the reasons that the Obama administration is saying that it's important to let this social experiment in Washington and, and Colorado go on and see what happens. This The, the founding fathers uh, had the idea that the states would serve as social laboratories, and so that is, seems to be exactly what's going on in these two states now. And if it turns out to be a disaster, well, then then we move away from that. Uh, if it turns that the sky is not falling, then we have a, a real opportunity to reduce the funding that goes to these gangs. Well, we, we have a disaster on our hands now uh, with, a, with a drug war, war that basically is a failure. Uh, our jails, our prisons are full of people uh, who've been arrested, and some people want to argue this point, but it's a reality for um, uh, low-level uh, drug offenses. Uh, in my opinion, the drug war is not working. No, it's um, not. People who want to s- use drugs, whether it is uh, marijuana or, or anything else, to include 
uh, prescription drugs uh, obtained illegally are able to get uh, those items and and they're using them. Uh, the debate, I guess, will go on forever. Do the laws pr do the laws reduce um, uh, abuse of of drugs of all no. kinds? Some say they do. Some argue they don't. Um, but I, I think we can look at the harm that's caused by. Uh, this uh, drug drug war that continues to grow in size and, in my opinion, spiral out of control. It becomes more expensive every single year and arguably less effective. Mm -hmm. um, we know that, right? We yes, know that. we do. So uh, it's 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 time to try something different. Yeah. It's nice, you know. It's nice hearing you say that. That's long been my how I pound on my pulpit is that is that drug abuse or addiction is a social problem, not a criminal issue. The only time it becomes a criminal issue is when somebody else is harmed. But a person right. doing drugs themselves, it's a social so, issue. So it should we be all agree as such. that drug abuse is a problem. Yes, uh, we where do. Where the oh, yes. disagreement comes in is how do we deal with the problem, and and should a cop be dealing with it? Should the government be dealing with it through? Uh, criminal uh, law. That's that's where we many of us disagree. Of course, and, and the question there is 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 drug abuse a health issue or is it a criminal justice issue? Uh, and if if you have a glass of wine with dinner a couple of times a week, is that alcohol abuse? Probably not. Uh, so not all use is abuse in whatever substance that you have. So um, we're going to get into that a little more when we come back. We're about to take a break, and sure. we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Did you know that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications? Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119. 702-388-1119 or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuananow.com. Thank you. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada Medical Marijuana card today. Come out and join us April 4th for Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium 4. N-C-M-S-4. That's April 4th at Main Street Station. Look on our website, www.wecan702.org or www.wecan702.com for details. This symposium is going to help you with your final draft regulations and also to get any people that you may need for your application. So make sure to join us on April 4th at the Main Street Station in the Roundhouse. You can find information at www.wecan702.org. Go to the top of the page and click on Symposium. That will take you to a direct link to register. Welcome to WeCan702, Nevada's Cannabis News Hour. We are on with Ted Moody. If you have any questions, please give us a call. Our phone number is 702-731-1230. The toll-free number is 1-866-820-5528. And today's guest is Sheriff Candidate Ted Moody. All Welcome back, Ted. Thank Welcome you. Back. All right. So to continue on, on the line we took just before the break, there's an article that I'm looking at here from the uh, Review Journal from two days ago, and it says, Police, marijuana grow houses bring violence to communities. And it says here that the proliferation of marijuana grow houses throughout Las Vegas is a problem that brings violence to the community, according to Metro Lieutenant Laz Chavez. It's a dangerous element that we don't need in our area, Chavez said last month. Uh, Sarah Pullen, a spokeswoman for the federal DEA, echoed the sentiment of marijuana 
marijuana and violence being intertwined. There have been many acts of violence associated <laughs> with indoor marijuana cultivation and at residence where marijuana is being sold. The residence is being used for indoor cultivation or in highly populated communities and neighborhoods where innocent people and children live. And Chavez wanted to be wanted to clear the air about exactly who the department t- tries to bust when it comes to marijuana. Don't get me wrong, we're not looking for medical patients at all, he said. Uh, we are purposefully seeking out criminals taking advantage of the Las Vegas market. Um, also, uh, he said that upscale neighborhoods are preferred by marijuana grow house operators because they are safer, which makes it easier to conduct business. So they, that sounds like a contradiction to me. Exactly. They tend to seek out safer neighborhoods, he said, because they don't want to get robbed. And like Metro, the DEA isn't focused on taking down recreational users or patients using medical marijuana. The main focus on dr- is on drug traffickers with excessive amounts of marijuana. You so, know, and they have it, it in that report, in that news report, there is not one act of violence that they have named. No, they, they, they're they just alluding, just alluding to it without to saying to it. Yeah, and I don't disagree with Laz Chavez on, on one thing. Uh, illegal, uh, unregulated grow houses can be dangerous, and that's, that's because uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're uh, at risk for fire. Uh, there mm-hmm. are other chemicals and things that sometimes are brought in there, fertilizers and things like that, not handled properly, uh, can, be, can be hazardous. And on occasion, one of those uh, one of those grow houses gets ripped off uh, by other black marketeers who mm-hmm. found out that uh, you know their There's competition uh, yeah. uh, uh, growing their stuff uh, at a certain location goes after it. But you know, I, I've tried to think in the 16 years that I've been in the valley, and I can't think of a single instance where a police officer has been killed or shot or stabbed at any time in any sort of uh, grow house type uh, of raid. And so uh, we see that routinely uh, Metro goes in with um, with violent SWAT raids and uh, something that that really could be done with a couple of detectives knocking on the door. Because if you've got a grow house, you're not going to be able to flush all those plants down the toilet. And the idea that you're coming in with the, these Guns high blazing. power destructive raids, um, I, I'm all about police safety, no doubt about it. But at the same time, when you come into a situation like that, you're and the guns are all out. You're escalating the chance that that you know somebody can trip and fall, and and there's a misfire and somebody gets hurt. And I I, I heard you speak on on this subject. And uh, could you care to uh, would elaborate? You care to elaborate? Well, I mean, you, you're you're hitting on so many different points. It's and I want to cover them all. Uh, you know, first of all, you look at the policies of the Metropolitan Police Department over the past several years. Even in the midst of, of all of the confusion surrounding uh, the, the, the uh, first versions of the medical marijuana laws that were passed in the state of Nevada, right? Um, uh, you can have it, but you have no way to get it. There was no mechanism put into place to allow people to legally obtain medical marijuana patients to legally obtain marijuana. And so people were violating the law and attempting to cultivate it in many cases, things like that. The dispensaries that did crop up around town, right? Mm-hmm. They were targeted by the Metropolitan Police Department. Even when, even when we had two uh, judges issue contradictory rulings, and you go back, what has it been, Mike? About yeah, two that was, years. That was 2012. Yes. Okay, so so about In two March. years uh, ago, you had uh, uh, Judge uh, Doug Mosley Smith and uh, Doug upheld the, the, the said the statute was no no uh, no problem. There's nothing wrong with it, and you had Don Mosley saying. Look, this is confusing. How can you expect anybody to comply and, with the and law? And Don Mosley was not yeah. by any chance yes. a, a bleeding heart, you know, who was soft on crime. No, he's, I, I can have a great deal of respect for Judge Mosley and consider him to be a, a legal scholar. And I'm not even addressing the issue of who was right or who was wrong. The point is even the judges, even the courts, couldn't agree on how to interpret this law. And at, and at that very time, the Metropolitan Police Department continued to target the dispensaries, putting police officers and other people at risk because we were using high-risk tactics and, and raids uh, to take off the, the dispensaries, right? Yes. There's th- yes. You know, medical marijuana stores. And I raised that uh, objection uh, at the time. All I can do is speak my mind. And, and uh, you know, you don't always get your way in, in uh, any business. And, and uh, I didn't expect to, but, but I did raise that objection. Now you now you talk about the illegal grow houses and what goes on with that. Uh, um, the, as, as I said, uh, the rare instances of violence that occur around the illegal grow houses result when one uh, 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 a dr- illegal drug uh, black marketeer is, is ripping off, trying to rip off another one. Um, 
the there are uh, home invasion robberies that are associated with um, uh, black market drug sales, usually not grow houses. You know, I, I worked robbery for a number of years in the mid 90s. I've watched this problem uh, in in the in Clark County for a long time. Uh, people who sell drugs out of their homes illegally, whether it's marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, pres- illegal prescription drugs, uh, eventually uh, they're at risk uh, for being targeted mm-hmm. uh, by others who want to uh, usurp their profits, to get in there and steal the cash that they have on hand from the sale of the narcotics uh, or to get the narcotics themselves and sell them. Uh, guns, uh, because they know that um, uh, folks that uh, are engaged in illegal activities are unlikely to call the police. Mm-hmm. You don't call the police and say, hey, you know, my, my, my stash of cocaine just got ripped <laughs> off. Pl- we found out about those kinds of robberies uh, when things really went bad and somebody got shot, somebody got hurt or killed. We, um, we have had several uh, patients have their, have their houses invaded or um, uh, home invaded. Um, somebody came over and burgled their house and stole all their cannabis. And it was and it was funny. It was one of the neighbors and how the police and they called the police. The the, the yeah. patient called the police and said, "Hey, my you know cannabis has been stolen." And they started laughing. They they said, "No, really, come out here. We're a yeah. patient." <laughs> yeah. Well, but, and 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 the, the the other the last piece of that, Mike, is and um, is that um, uh, you know when when the law or the enforcement of the law starts to cause more harm in society then the offense that we're acting against, isn't it time for us to stop and pause and step back and ask ourselves if this is really the right uh, direction to be proceeding? I mean, we're putting police officers at risk for serious injury or death. We're putting innocent citizens in many cases at risk for serious injury or death using high-risk raids and high-risk tactics to enforce low-level marijuana offenses. Uh, the day that I'm elected sheriff, that will all stop. We will not use SWAT teams. We won't use high-risk raids and tactics to enforce low-level marijuana offenses. If we had Hallelujah. a pol- thank you. If we had a policy like that in place uh, a few years ago, uh, Trevon Cole would still be alive. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and um, our officer and, and that officer's family wouldn't have gone through all of the emotional trauma and legal uh, a trauma that they've gone through since that unfortunate incident happened. So. Uh, that's where I stand on that issue. So, Ted, you sound, uh, you're talking about working robbery in the 90s, and you sound like you've been here a long time. Are you a native of Las Vegas? My family came here in 1975, Mike. My dad took a job out at the Nevada test site when they were still doing underground nuclear testing out there. Started here in the ninth grade, um, graduated from high school in 79, joined the Marine Corps, uh, four years in the Marine Corps, came back here came back home to Las Vegas in 1983 and was within a few months was hired by the Metropolitan Police Department. So I started, I was 21. I turned 22 in the police academy. Wow. So your career uh, has been as a public servant for all these years. So you've absolutely seen uh, most every aspect of Metro uh, from the inside. 30 years, two months. Um, uh, worked my way up through the ranks. When I chose to leave in July of last year, I was the assistant sheriff for operations, which made me the number three guy in the organization. And I'd been in that job for more than five years. So absolutely, I'm very familiar uh, with, um, with uh, all aspects of the operation we, of Metro, the budget, you name it. Can we talk about why you left or of why course. you stepped down? Yeah, I talk, about it, talk about it all the time. Uh, so, well, sir, why did, you, why did you choose to step down from well, that position? Uh, reducing police use of deadly force has become my greatest passion over the years. Uh, particularly the last 10 years, I've worked on some uh, programming here, some innovative programming here, starting with... Uh, our crisis intervention team back in, well, we did our first class in 2003. A lot of the preliminary work was done even prior to that. Our crisis intervention teams are designed to train police officers uh, to avoid violent outcomes when they're interacting with people who are mentally ill and or an emotional crisis. First uh, crisis intervention team of its kind in the state of Nevada has spread all throughout the state. I'm confident when I say that thou- our CIT officers working hard every day have saved thousands of lives because of that training. In 2011, I started what is now our reality-based training program, uh, which teaches teams of frontline officers to avoid the need to use deadly force through teamwork as well as innovative uh, training. And, of course, in 2012 and 2013, I led the charge within Metro to completely overhaul and reform Metro's internal civilian use of force review process. Now, yeah, and I'll tell you a little more about that, if you don't mind. Now, the the reality-based training and the reformed uh, use of force review board were just recognized by the United States Department of Justice in in their September report on Metro as, uh, quote, milestones, end quote, 
for well, the department. Uh, well, the the point is, no matter how no matter how outstanding, innovative the programming, no matter how talented, dedicated, hardworking are many of the people at, at Metro who really want to um, uh, get get the department to the next level, without uh, complete and full support from the very top. Unfortunately, it's not going to matter, and that's why the sheriff's race is just absolutely uh, so incredibly important. Um, now, the, the the use of force review board that uh, that I helped uh, uh, form, um, everything was fine with that process, right? As long as we were hearing non-controversial shootings. But when that board caught a shooting where an officer had shot an unarmed kid, kid yeah. had nothing nothing but a uh, nothing more than a baseball cap in his hand. Uh, the board heard all the evidence, and as the chair, I, I wasn't a voting member, but I was present for five hours of uh, evidence presentation, including the officer's testimony, and the board made a very courageous, uh, unprecedented decision. And in my opinion, they made the right decision, okay, uh, based on the evidence that they had available, and they recommended, and I, remember, the board, is, the board is made up of a combination of civilians as well as uh, commission uh, members of the Metropolitan Police Department, and in the case of our new board, just the best people you'd want to have from outside the organization, not biased against the police, not biased in favor of the police, not related to anybody who's on the department, just wanted to spend their valuable time, and we had businessmen, lawyers. Um, these were people that had plenty of other stuff to be doing, but they were yeah. demo- devoting their time to help us. We had some of the best and brightest people from within the organization, and they, they all recommended the termination of this officer in this particular case. And I watched in fascination as uh, the current administration at Metro, together with the police unions, uh, circled the wagons and chose not to support the decision of the board. Now, had there been a good reason, you know, had, had there been a violation of the officer's due process, had there been some yep. new evidence that had been brought to light that would change the opinion, I'd be screaming from the treetops to, uh, to, to, to check the decision, start over. But the public reason that was given for ignoring that decision was well. The guy said he was sorry. So, oh my heavens! So I knew at that point, and it and, and it, it 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 was just obvious to me from 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 that moment that uh, my thirty year two month career at Metro had uh, had come to an end. I had done everything I could do on the inside of the organization. I had been the poster boy for a process that I helped build and that I truly believed in, that I still believe in today. Yeah. Uh, and I put my reputation on the line with a lot of great people and. Uh, the only way that they were going to know that I had nothing to do with any of that was to do what I did. So I made the only right decision anybody could have made, and I quit. I resigned uh, from Metro. Uh, never really left. I mean, I'm still here working harder than ever, you know, yeah, trying to yeah. get it, get the organization back on track. And I, I would think that there there are a lot of news reports over the years. It's no, no secret that uh, a lot of news organizations write articles saying that there are an awful lot of shootings uh, here in the Las Vegas Valley by the, by the police. And when you have these things happen and you have that kind of public reception, it can't be good for the morale of, of the line officers. It has been so hard on every single frontline officer out there, Mike. Thanks for bringing that up and making that observation because it has been terribly uh, difficult uh, for these officers over the last uh, four years in particular as we've gone through this process with the coroner's inquest, the old coroner's inquest process, and it was challenged, went to the Supreme Court, and then the county commission decided to adopt a completely different process. And it's, it's been terrible. That they, uh, the, the officers of this organization, more than anything else, they need strong leadership and some certainty and some stability in terms of what to expect when they're involved in a shooting. And if I may say something, sure. uh, we have so many great people within the Metropolitan Police Department, and they all want to do the right thing. Um, in the vast majority of cases, when they have to use deadly force, and, it's, and it's, it is when they have to do it. Our, our good cops at Metro, they don't want to hurt anybody. They certainly don't want to kill anybody. But when they have to use that last resort, their actions are usually above reproach. And most of them will go through this process of accountability, whatever it may be, the coroner's inquest uh, process that used to exist, the current uh, so-called uh, fatality review process or the internal uh, process without any problems whatsoever. Those aren't the cases that cause us, that get us in trouble at Metro. The ones that get us in trouble are where, we've, where we shoot people who turn out to be unarmed or we make bad decisions, use bad tactics that get us into situations where we have to use deadly force when had we thought about it a little bit and made a different decision, we might not have uh, put ourselves in that position. So um, 
the, the only way to make it possible for our good cops to, to do a difficult policing job here in Las Vegas is for, for be, because this environment is so difficult, uh, is to do two things. We have to develop, implement, and fully support to the top two things. Uh, the most innovative, consistent, realistic training aimed at reducing police use of deadly force of any organization in the United States, bar none. Bar none. That's number one. We have to be national leaders. And number two, we have to develop the most collaborative, transparent, uh, constructive, fact-based process for the review of those incidents of any organization in the United States. There's no shortcut. There's no easy way out. We must be national leaders in this regard. I, I, I happen to agree with that. I, I think that Metro uh, right now, with all of these shootings, the, the reputation has been damaged as such that if we don't get on the top of the pile and, and make ours the best in the, in the right. nation, then, then the that's reputation right. is not going to recover. See, and, and these the people, including my opponents, who advocate protectionism, isolationism, circle the wagons, lower the bar, reduce accountability, protect everybody every time, no matter what the circumstances. They uh, pretend to have the best interests of our police officers uh, in mind. In reality, they don't. In reality, they have the police department on a trajectory to disaster. Because if, if we don't step up within the organization and lead and clean our own house ourselves, then guess what? Somebody else is going to come do it. Whether it's the federal government, look at Los Angeles, uh, where the Board of County Supervisors there is building a statute, uh, uh, and I'll quote, uh, create by statute the best possible mechanism for civilian oversight. Okay, that's scary to me, and it, and it should be scary to every good cop uh, here at Metro. I don't want to see it happen to us. I think we're better than that. Well, I, you know, I agree with you that the the vast majority of the Metro officers that I've run into over the past 16 years have been dedicated public servants, uh, and, and they do a great job. I, Unfortunately, we know that no human system is perfect, and so when you have a, a, a top echelon that is putting up that blue wall and saying, oh, you know, we're absolutely, we are, we are models of perfection and anything we do is right, uh, it just erodes public confidence. Doesn't it? I mean, it's, ar it's an arrogance. It's a type of arrogance where uh, we're going to do what we want to do and, um, there, because we can, and there's no accountability. And so when I'm in that seat, we'll pick up right where we left off with the uh, Civilian Use of Force Review Board. Yay. And barring, barring some new evidence, barring a violation of employee due process rights, I will not interfere in that. We'll build the best system, and then I will let it work. That's the only way for us to help our best cops at Metro and secure their future. We have a phone call caller who's been waiting patiently. Uh, we have Barry on the line. Welcome to the show, Barry. Uh, what's your question for Ted? Thank you very much. First, I'd like to say that I've been doing a lot of research on the sheriff's candidates and uh, and uh, Moody's the best I've seen so far. Uh, all the other guys, uh, you know, I have issues with, but by far, um, uh, I like him the best, and he definitely is getting my vote. Thank you. Um, no problem. My question is, um, I have two questions real quick. One is, do you know anything about the Southern Nevada Health District passing on the medical marijuana patient applications onto Metro to do the felon checks? And if that is true that Metro is doing the felon checks, will you uh, work with the Southern Nevada Health District to take the responsibility of doing the felon checks so medical marijuana patients aren't scared to get their card out of fear of prosecution? Yes, absolutely. We'll support it um, uh, as in any way necessary, any way, shape, or form necessary. I, I believe currently, though, that the it's in, this is done by the state, and Nevada sends it to the uh, Nevada Division of Criminal Records. And what they do is they 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 search the the Western states uh, regional database for felonies. So I, I it was my understanding that that Metro is not involved in well, that process. Well, you can you can go to Metro for your background check. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and on some paperwork it says, you know, to go to Metro for your background check. But I, I went to the same place where I got my teacher's background check done, and, that's, and that was good enough. Yeah. It's, it's hard for me to say. Uh, I was not involved in the, um, in the uh, medical marijuana process while I was at Metro. I was an operations guy for most of my entire 30-year career. I wouldn't be surprised if Metro was providing some services to some other agency in that regard simply because we have access to that information. It's not hard to do it. 
Uh, but the cards, the cards under the current law are issued by the state of Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles, right? Yes. And they have access to all the same information. So unless there's some specialized uh, check uh, that needed to be done, you know, Metro does a lot of that type of work. We we issue work cards and things of that nature, which is another the tan another cards and the blue cards yeah, and all of that discussion. And we do do provide the the background checks and those things. So there's some expertise there. There's a system in place to do it. I wouldn't be surprised. But no, I don't know anything about it if it is happening. Yeah, I, I don't think it is. Um, so we're we're going to go to another break now, and we will be back with a sheriff candidate Ted Moody in just a minute. Right. Stay tuned. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Weekend 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at Weekend 702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash weekend 702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. Welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. You're joining us today with Ted Moody, the candidate for sheriff. Uh, welcome back, Ted. Thank if you'd you. like to call in, please give us a call at 702-731-1230. Our toll-free number is 1-866-820-5528. Let, let me ask you, Ted. I, people love to complain uh, about anything. And so, you know, people complain about government, about taxes, in, in, in this case, uh, about Metro. And... Uh, in looking at the various candidates, uh, I, I heard one of them say, well, if you like, you know, Sheriff Gillespie, I'm cut from the same cloth and I'll be exactly the same thing. Uh. And, you know, there are a lot of people uh, who do and there are a lot of people who don't. Uh, and so we we need to for all of those people, they need to get involved. They need to they need to campaign. They need to contribute. They need to knock on their neighbor's doors, have discussions. And, and more importantly than anything, they need to be registered and they need to go out and vote because yep. we're up against a big machine, aren't we? Yeah, we are indeed. Now, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm out on limb here. You know, I broke ranks and the establishment uh, doesn't doesn't like that, you know, too much. And so I've taken a stand on the issues. I'm going to I'm going to uh, never waver on that. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't trade places uh, with any of my opponents for all the money in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm running on my values. I'm running on principle. Uh, now, whether or not that, that gets us, that gets me or this community anywhere in the future is up to the community, isn't it? And um, uh, uh, sure, the donations are great, but you know what's going to really be important is uh, you say you've got 20,000 listeners out there. Uh, that we're talking to uh, perhaps right now, some portion of that. Every single one of them has to make sure they're registered, has to make sure they get out and vote in the primary. Early voting starts on May 24th. Election day is June 10th. Get your friends, um, uh, you know, round up 10 or 20 people and take them with you. Get them out there to vote. There are enough votes. This community does count for something in this community if it will awaken and stand up and take back its Metropolitan Police Department, this community can make a difference. And you can say that, that the vote, especially in, in the primary, which is going to get it down to two candidates and, and the general in, in June, are your vote will have an outsized influence because unlike a presidential election or even the November midterms, these tend to be very low turnout votes. So if, if you really feel that there is a, a problem here and that we, we need to move forward on on fixing that problem if you go out and vote you your vote might have the effect of of 
five or, or ten votes in, in a presidential election. So you're absolutely right, Ted, that if people bring 10 or 20 people people down to the voting polls with them, uh, and they're all registered voters, that they can have a very outsized influence on what we happens. We will win. Well, thank if you. If for- they do that, we will win. And so they, it's absolutely critical that they get out there and vote. Uh, that's the truth. And, you know, uh, the other thing is, is that those 10 or 12 friends, on, like you said, Michael, they need to be registered voters. Mm-hmm. You cannot register the day that you're voting. So make sure to get out and register to vote early, and then you can vote in this election. And together we can do it. We can get uh, Sheriff Moody elected for, uh, you know, for sheriff, and we can clean up a uh, metro. Absolutely. Absolutely we can. And, and although Metro is, by, by and large, a clean organization. We don't make mistakes Yeah, and about I'm that. glad you mentioned it. Let me, let me jump in. I mean, they're definitely, you know how I feel. You know where I yeah. stand. There are things that we need to do better. Most of them have to do with the leadership at the top in the organization, not with the, the people out front on the front lines doing, doing the work. Um, it has to do with the budget. I mean, we've got to, we've got mm-hmm. to uh, first and foremost deal with Metro's budget. And, you know, hey, and I talk to the unions about the same thing, the police union contracts. We've got to deal with those things as opposed to running out and demanding more taxes and uh, more money from, from taxpayers who are already strapped uh, in order to regain the moral high ground and, 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 and to be able to have a serious conversation in the future about growing this organization. Uh, first, we have to take those those intermediate steps. Otherwise, uh, it's done. But uh, remember, we've got over 5,000 employees at Metro commissioned and civilian. And uh, day in and day out, the vast majority of those employees are doing a fantastic job protecting and serving with honor and distinction. Uh, The mistakes that are, I mean, just the police alone, 2,500 or so officers, a few less than that, are handling a million dispatch calls every single year. And they do a fabulous job on most of those. You got uh, another uh, 750 corrections officers uh, managing over 3,500 inmates in a couple of different facilities. And then all the great civilians that support those officers on both sides, they're doing a great job. And there's a lot of leadership, talent, and ability at Metro. The, the few areas uh, that we have, to, we have to fix in order to save this great organization you know what they are. I've already said it. So Yes. Well, you know, you, you talk about issues with, with leadership at the top. And uh, before we went on the air, we, we were discussing a story that broke on, I believe it was Channel 3 just last week, where uh, mm. it seems that, that uh, it's coming out from a retired police officer, a police captain, that Metro is now investigating commissioners Sisolak and Junkiliani and surveilling them and looking for some sort of way to jam them up because they voted against the 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 more uh, no cops, cops uh, tax tech. increase and you and I Ted were both down there that day testifying against this thing so am, right. I, am I worried about the black helicopters In January 21st you know I was right there I stood up and publicly spoke out against not against the basic idea of more cops on our streets but just against uh, a very bad plan for a very bad tax um, you know, it's a little early yet. Uh, I think uh, uh, former Captain O'Leary is going to be back on Channel 3 again tonight and tell some more of the story. Um, we've, he's been on twice already. It's interesting to follow this as it develops. Uh, we don't know uh, exactly what happened yet. Uh, maybe we never will. But indeed, if something like that happened, it is um, a misuse and abuse of, of police power. Uh, period, end of story. If I'm the sheriff, if I'm in that seat, uh, nobody in that organization is going to be confused about what is appropriate behavior and what direction to go. Instead of trying to bully um, uh, other elected officials in order for us to get our way, the, the right approach is to build those bridges. And that, that's a, an important part of my platform is repairing and rebuilding relationships with other elected officials and, and the people in general. Um, uh, because running Metro is not a one-man show. It's a minimum of four-way partnership between us, the community, the city, and the county. Can't do it on on, on your own. And ha- having met you and and spoken with you several times, and and you know, sort of taken your measure. Uh, I, I can believe that you will be that kind of sheriff, that you will not brook that kind of uh, malfeasance. You. And so I, I think it's important for people to meet you uh, in order to, if you're going to vote for people who are going to have such an undue influence on your life, you should get out there and meet them. And, and uh, I 
the next weekend seminar is going to be on April 4th at the Main Street Station, and you can register for the seminar at www.wecan702.org slash symposium, and come on out and, and meet Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Candidate, pardon me, uh, speaking a little presumptuously there, Sheriff Candidate uh, Ted Moody, who will be speaking to the uh, the attendees, and, and get out there and, and get involved. And well, so... Uh, the other thing is, is that that, uh, that do you have any do you have any appearances beforehand so somebody can come up and shake your hand without coming to our yeah. symposium uh, fundraiser stuff like that how can we contact you um, you know to help you with your well when you I'll tell you what it, it, those are great questions when I leave here I'm going out to UNLV um, uh, uh, to meet with a group and we're going to be talking a lot about the the same issues that we have been discussing uh, in here this afternoon this is the Young Americans for Liberty at UNLV and the student union there. I believe that uh, Southern Nevada Watchdogs is working on uh, Town Hall. Mm -hmm. Oh, Um, Tasha Heath. Tell Tasha Heath for me. Tasha (laughs) Heath and Melissa Letourneau. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think the the date may have moved. Um, Originally, I believe we were going to... Uh, do that within the next couple of weeks on a Saturday. You know what I can do, Mike, is get you that information yeah, when we'll, we get we'll, a firm we'll date in case people want to yeah. come out there. Sure. And, and yeah, we have a website. It's tedmoodyforsheriff.com. It's really and easy that, to that find. that four is, is the number four, right? Not, the, not spelling out... F O R, right? Uh, it, how, man, look at here. <laughs> how can you stump me on that question? Um, I, I think it was uh, spelled out. Is it spelled four. out? Okay, I'm, I'm not. Really I'm sure. not hundred. See, now if I'm wrong, I'm going to feel so. I'll look it up. So I'm going to look it up right now. Uh, anyway, when you run that, when you yeah. set that up, tedmoodyforsheriff.com, you'll get the right hit. It'll take you to the mm-hmm. website. There's a lot of information there. Uh, tell you tell you about me. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's a way to register as a volunteer on the website. Mm-hmm. There's a way to donate online if you choose to do that. And please don't be intimidated by that. We have people from throughout this community that have given uh, as little it's, as $25 in a donation. So uh, I found your website. It's actually www.tedmoody.com, and there is a contribute button up in the right-hand corner. There's no four in it. And no sheriff. Okay. It's at tedmoody.com. Tedmoody.com. Ted. T e d m o o d y dot com. Do we okay, want to say fine. it like three more times. That'll here? work. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much. So hit the website. We all, there's a link in there to Facebook too, right? Yeah. Um, yes, there you is. Know, go to go to Facebook and uh, we welcome your comments. Like it, share it, all those things. We really appreciate every little bit of helps. This is going. If we're going to win, this is going to have to be a true grassroots effort. No pun intended. Absolutely. No, we like okay. grassroots efforts. It, definitely, we do. And so, uh, to reiterate, uh, Ted will be appearing at the uh, the Weekend uh, uh, Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium Four at Main Street Station on April fourth, which is next Friday. Uh, also appearing will be Jackie Holloway, Director of Business Licensing for Clark County. Marla McDade Williams, the Deputy Director of uh, the Nevada Health Division. Uh, we expect to have Senator Tick Siegerblom there, the bill's sponsor, uh, as well as security uh, consultants, real estate people, uh, various uh, business and um, other experts who are going to help these applicants uh, fine-tune their applications and look at the the recent uh, state uh, regulations that have just been released and as well as the county application which was released just yesterday so this industry is moving very very quickly and uh, it's going to happen there's there's been a lot of question and debate as to whether these dispensaries will be open this year or next year uh, the really? way I, the way I think see things moving along it's going to happen by October or well so. that's what I thought is September or October that they would be opening up you know and I just have to uh, I just have to say here that I think Jacqueline Holloway is so cute she is such a good speaker that i was just blown away the first time i heard her and 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 she's just got such a great personality very engaging we we are lucky to have jackie as a public servant as we are as we are lucky to have uh the vast majority of people who work in metro uh, that's and, true and you know thank you for saying so when i was talking about you know cleaning up metro i I'm, i really wasn't talking about the rank and file you know for the most part any interaction that i've had with metro has been a great one uh, no it sounds like 
mistaken, but thank you very much. Yeah. All, all right. Well, it sounds like we're uh, wrapping up the show. We, we, we're, thank you, guys. We're getting ready to wrap up. Ted Moody, uh, thank you so much for coming in and, and giving us some straight talk here. Uh, I'm Join sure us next our Tuesday. audience appreciates it. Yes, by all means. Join us next Tuesday uh, where we will have more on this incredible uh, social revolution that's taking place. And um, until then, keep fighting. Keep fighting.